the program itself that we're talking about is called, we, it was a partnership that we had with the Manitoba Museum called the Spirit Lines Project. And what that entailed was that uh, the museum itself found some recordings of our elders that were done in the early 70s, 1970s. And, and with that, so they approached us here in, in our community to see if we would be interested in working on a project with them to, to translate and, and bring these back into a production um, to be used, to de develop as kits to be used in the school. Then they also, um, we looked at the, using the, some, art, some of the artifacts that the museum had in, in, in stored or in storage uh, that were gathered from this area, you know, in throughout throughout history. So, after a meeting we had with them, we agreed that you know we had them. Some of our elders, our community folks, our teachers, our, some of our staff were involved in this. Um, we had a discussion, and we agreed that yes, this is what we would be very interested in moving forward with, with this project. Uh, now, at that time, we didn't specifically identify what grade, uh, in, uh, in the grade levels. We just indicated that a kit that could be utilized right from nursery right up to right up to grade twelve. So, you know, depending on how the teachers wanted to use it. So, the kit was uh, not uh, grade specific or age specific. And what it became was that, um, you know, with with the elder stories, um, these these stories were elders, you know, that that information that they shared of what their life was like, or they could have shared a legend. Um, in, in growing up, uh, you know, while they, you know, during the during the time when there was a fur trade, or during a time when the, uh, they were traveling in York boats or or living out in trap lines so so that and that is something that a lot of our young people now and their students have no concept about at this time so it was excellent for us to have these stories and what was uh, incredible about this as well was that we actually had some uh, recordings audio recordings of our, these elders telling the stories and that that itself uh, you know we when they told the stories the, the tone of the voice, the, the excitement of whatever it is that they were telling, uh, it was all there, so as if, as if the person was there with you. Now, we didn't have the audio recordings of all of them, so what we had to do with us, the ones that we didn't have audio recordings was, there was um, uh, myself and two other staff members, uh, uh, you know, one of them has passed on since, uh, his name is late Byron Abitagan, and his wife Pauline Abitagan, we retold these stories in the line, in, in the way they were written, and of course we tried to make it as exciting mm -hmm. or as, you know with the tone and everything as much as we could, but I'm sure we didn't come close to the actual the actual storytelling itself, and you know so that that itself was was you know so all the all those audio recordings were there were put into a CD, and. With the kit itself that was developed for the students, that the students now can listen to these uh, within the, the listening centers, the stories, and they can follow along in the books. Now it's it's written in English, and it's also written in Cree, so that the students could follow um, the, the story in in the Roman orthography um, Cree, you know, as, as they're reading it. Now part of the next step that when that I had a discussion with the museum is that we should put that into uh, syllabics as well. <clears throat> so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, because we're, we we're already looking at some um, possibly reproduction of these books. And if we do the reproduction, we would include the, the, uh, the, the syllabics form. Um, the, other, the other part of this that was exciting was that we did the artifacts of uh, recreating the artifacts. So we had local artists that did uh, like like a watch pouch, and we also did um, uh, you know in terms of the way the the snowshoes were were made. So there was some information on that and basket weaving uh, information in there. So the, 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 this, what what I have seen in the schools is that some of this some of the teachers have have read the stories or have listened to the stories with the students. 
And what they've done is that they've created some form of um, um, stories themselves that maybe the students have gone home and gathered the stories from their parents or grandparents, as well as uh, they've using paper and other materials is they've done little um, recreations of uh, of it could have been gauntlets or it could have been slippers and it was actually cute I, I was into a in one of the grade two classrooms and they did like slippers so they you know where where they, the normally the fur would be they had cotton used mm -hmm. for the, the, the make a, a slipper and they had these displayed in their classroom and and, and they think it was seeing the excitement of the students in in them and asking them and them telling me what what they were doing and and it, they, there was a sense of pride in there that you could see in their faces in their eyes that there is something that they knew that this was ours this was you know and so i think it was excellent to see that for, for me it's it's uh, I, I i don't i, I look more at our our version of it in our language meaning in in you know, which is you know cree um and and our my vision, I guess, is, has been that when we take a look at our, our, you know, uh, and this is what I've been telling our school division, this is what I've been telling our community, this is what I've been telling our staff, is that let's not get caught up in using the English version of the words, because to me, it, it hinders us in, 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 in what we want to do. As an example, uh, well, when we talk about wanting to teach our language, we, we get we get tied into all these different types of immersion or bilingual or, or subject course and and we don't end up doing what we intended to do because we're we're limited by what those words mean but if we talk about it in our language and say in an imwin and and that has a totally different meaning and then it means that you know we're not restricted to how we're gonna do it? We're just go ahead and go ahead and do it. So when we when I start talking about indigenous education, I I'm thinking about you know you have to I have to change my way of thinking into thinking in my way in our way, and and when I start thinking in our way, it makes so much sense. It makes so much easier because I'm not limited by the English version of the word because I think in English version it it limits me to what. What I'm supposed to do or what I'm supposed to have. I think um, when I start thinking about um, learning, about it, it's it's lifelong. It's 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 not it's not structured uh, 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 grade one, grade two, grade three, and then you you pass or you know you've achieved this level, so you're ready for the next level. You know, it's not structured in that way. Because of the way our education system, our learning has been, is that um, it started off, of course, by uh, you know, when, and, and some of the elders and some of the uh, um, some of the traditional knowledge keepers have you know shared that information with me. Said when we were young and we're still in babies in in in, uh, in baskets or you know wherever they they had tied us up, tied us and kept us kept us warm. They said they would hang us from a branch or a tree or something like that while they're doing all the work and of course that's where the learning starts from you know you, you're watching you're observing you're listening you're hearing the language and and so it it, it starts from there and as you move along and then in life you you know you, you, yes you achieve certain uh, stages of your life and, and even those stages were were explained to me in how you know so those were recognized in a very ceremonial way that yes you were ready for the next stage of your life you know and and, and that didn't require where you had to do a test and you passed or not and you had to do it over again you know but but it, it was a learning process and it kept going so and as part of all that too, you take a look at uh you know you're not structured just sitting in the uh four in four walls you know stick closed in by four walls. Um, it, it's it's land-based learning as well. Like you learn a lot from the outdoors, you, you're, how you're connected to the land and all the things that, uh, you know, from what I've learned from our elders and from our traditional knowledge keepers is that 
even our language in the way that, that it describes the functions of um, your body or, or the food or the medicines that you use and it, it all ties in and, it, and, and to this day like when, when I hear and I listen to those I'm just amazed at how connected our people were to, 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 to the land and the knowledge base that they had and they, that how they were able to survive, how they were able to knew, know that, uh, that uh, you know, what is it that they needed to know to survive and to, to live in harmony, I guess I can say, with, with, with the land and everything else. So when, when you look at it that way, um, it's different from, um, from the way our students are learning today. And, I, and you know, that's why I think a lot of our students are not achieving at the level that they should because it's not we're not taking into account the that aspect of the way they, they you know our, our traditional ways of learning I think nationally we 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 need to recognize that there is there is a we need to do something there there's a problem I'll give you an example of our languages um now, we're losing our languages at an alarming rate. Now, the only reason why, the only reason why it hasn't become a national problem is because our languages are regionalized or localized, and they're not a national language. Like, like let's say in Canada, which is the official language now, English was disappearing. It would be a, a, a catastrophe. It would be emergency. It'd be comedies. It'd be whatever that, that you know, the government and everybody else would, would put into place. But because we we have sectional sections of the country of the continent where certain languages, certain groups of people live, so when we lo when we're losing our language, as for example, as as a, as a, as, a, as Cree people, then it's it's not it's not a national tragedy. It's it's a regional. So it's not you know it's people who don't know about the language obviously are, don't care about it. You know. Whether it's there or not, uh, so I think I think that's there is definitely a need for a national recognition of of things that need to be done. However, having said that, though, uh, I think you know now it's not going to be a one size fit all, but at least being aware of the similarities that are that are there in each regional or in each group. And then something that could be brought forth to say, yes, you know what, this needs to be done. We need to work on this in, in these different areas, maybe not in every area. And, and, and I, yes, I strongly believe that in order for us to be able to ensure that the, the, the language, the history, their way of life is, is preserved, is, 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 uh, is uh, kept alive uh, and making sure our young people, you know, I, I don't expect anybody from the outside to come in and say to us, this is what you need to do. You know, I, I'm expecting me from the inside to tell people coming in, this is where I need your help. You know, you can help us by doing whatever. This is that we that need to be done. But here, and, and I think our people need to recognize that as well, that um, it, it's like, you know, how how do I... How do I? How would I expect somebody to come from the West Coast to come and teach me about my language? And that's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. And so I think it, in that sense that yes, we need to ensure that the the, the, the um, that is recognized locally and that, that the assistance is there. I think a lot of times, uh, what happens is people don't know where to start. Um, you know, we, we're also used to having people coming and do something and then so people are you know well, well let's wait you know somebody will come and help us but i i think that's the, that's the downfall of what the, the history has taught us and now it, i think i don't think that we need to it be we can't be sitting still and we can't be saying you know what yes yeah somebody is going to come and do this for us no it has to be as it has to come from within um in my experience with the language programs that i've studied that work that have worked the best is that it has developed evolved from like the grassroots right from the community and with the community involvement with the elders involved with the schools and the students and the parents 
all committing that, yes, this is important and this is what we need to do. I've seen those to be the, the best programs, uh, the best uh, forms of support that work. So yes, I think uh, as much as we want to do sometimes things, do things nationally, it's, it's the region set or the localized versions of them that are going to work the best. You know, the project that we worked on got a um, Governor General's Award for history. And when we went to Ottawa, we met other award winners or award finalists that that they were working on different projects, like different, it, it, it had to do with language, it had to do with history, it had to do with you know, some of the the, um, the the way of life and, and, and all, all of it had to do with almost like the preservation or the uh, re, you know, just re, re, make sure that the, this was something that was reproduced or reproduction of, uh, of material that could be shared or that could be used uh, by the community or by the schools. And the nice thing about what I saw with each project, with the, with the museums and other organizations were involved with, whatever it is that they produced, was the ownership was given back to the community. Mm -hmm. So that I think that was the best thing that I saw. I know within our project that we did with the Spirit Lines, uh, Norway House, yes, was part of it, but we, they also had Garden Hill, who had similar stories as well. So it was a it was a, a, a project that was worked on with the Mantobia Museum with the two with the two communities.